Uh, Chloe Petz, what we like to do uh, on Private Parts now is you have to look down the barrel of the camera and you have to describe yourself in 30 seconds. Oh, God. Okay. Tell me when to go. Go. Using only swear words. <laughs> uh, twat. <laughs> uh, heinous criminal. No, I. Uh, my name is Chloe. I am a stand-up comedian. Um, I, what are the key things about me? I really like football. That's nice, isn't it? It's great. Uh, I, I really like pastries. Mm, um, me too. Yeah, I've sort of had a bit of... No, I should get back to introducing myself. I grew up in a town called City and Born in Kent. Uh, I currently live in Hackney. And um, that, that's that's it. That's it for me. <laughs> that's it, Chloe. Welcome yeah, to the podcast. <laughs> it's pastry, Chloe. Everyone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, pastry pets <laughs> in the studio. <laughs> She's covered in crumbs. <laughs> Chloe, I, do you, are you, do you get upset? Because I know you're a huge football fan. Crystal Palace, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you upset when it's out of season? Um, uh, sort of. I think sometimes it's good to have like a bit of a reprieve from it because. Um, my my social life does suffer. There was one that summer where it was World Cup and Love Island. Yeah. And I sort of went about my normal life, but fit also fit in all of the games and all of Love Island. <laughs> so I must have sort of just um, not slept for the duration of that. Um, so yeah, it is an obsession. So I think it's sometimes good that I have a forced break from yeah. it. Yeah, it is. I, 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 for me, right, with football... Is that I, when I was younger, I was a Chelsea fan. I grew up a Chelsea fan, but I never had that like diehard thing. For me, I just don't understand the fact that my weekend is determined whether my team win, wins or loses. Mm. That's like the most hectic thing to go into. And you have 32 weeks of it or whatever you have. Yeah, you, you have just described anxiety there, which is like <laughs> fixating over something that is beyond your control. Yeah, yeah literally. <laughs> yeah, I know. And I've just actively chosen that as my lifestyle. But I'm getting much better at it as I, as I age. And I think it's because people are starting to hold me accountable of like, Chloe. What, if, it's, if Crystal Palace lose? Yeah, they're like, if Crystal Palace lose, they're like, it's fine for you to ruin your own weekend, but you're not ruining mine. <laughs> yeah. All right. How bad did you get back when you were younger? How bad were you when Crystal Palace was lost? Crystal Palace, it was fine because I got quite used to it. It was, it was more <laughs> when um, England would get knocked out of major tournaments that I would really sob. And even... Are even you the, serious? <laughs> oh, yeah. It got to the point where um, when Germany knocked us out, there, mm. do you remember when... Um, Frank Lampard scored a goal. It went over the line and yeah. then it got destroyed. Yeah, he scored the header. Wasn't it the header? I think it was a header, yeah. Very yeah. well, very well yeah, remembered. Yeah. And it went over the freaking line. It went over the freaking oh, line. Oh yeah, I do remember this. Do you remember yeah, this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cried for two hours and my mum was trying to be empathetic and then eventually said, Chloe, this is absolutely pathetic. You need to go and have a shower and calm down. <laughs> so. I remember, I remember when it was like 90, 98 World Cup and it was, we played, um, it was Brazil, England and it was when Ronaldinho lobbed Seaman with that, with the free kick. <laughs> we love that. He loved a see mid match. Where, yes, like, where did he love the see mid? Yeah. Um, Have some of that. And that was actually the start of the Me Too movement. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. yeah. yeah throw it at Me Too. <laughs> Don't just give it to him. Now that, that is a classic joke. Do you know what? That's got that's yeah. getting around yeah. the floor. Yeah. That is yeah. that is classic yes. joke writing. <laughs> I always think I always think that at school being cool. If your name was David Seaman. As soon as it, when you're doing a road call, there's no way that no one... Doing when a it road came to, call? Well, I don't a know. Road call. Oh, it's a road call. <laughs> road call. Have you been What's calling that? it a road call your whole yes. entire life? You do yes. have, there's a few words that you just say wrong and I've just never corrected you. Yeah, loads of words I say wrong. I thought it was road call. Well, what, but why would it be? Come on, have a think about it for one That's one maybe second. like in a prison if you're like working on the roads or something. <laughs> Shit, what is it? Roll call? Roll call, I think, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you know what else I thought it was the other day? Um... I, I I thought it was um, pop belly. See, that's that's more. It's pot. It, it's pot, isn't it's it? It's pot. But that po pip, I was confused with that for a while. That makes more sense because it's like your belly's popping out. Mm. <laughs> Whereas pot, what's why is it called that? I don't know. It's called pot belly. I have no clue. But anyway, going back to David Seaman, <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I always think being called when David Seaman was younger, when it was a roll call, when it came to his name, surely everyone was sniggering or laughing in the class. Because obviously his surname being Seaman. I think you can get away with it if you are David Seaman though, because he's absolutely <laughs> I think, massive. I think that's, no why he, that's why he became a very successful footballer, just out of spite. Out of spite. Because they were laughing at him. He's like, I'll show you. That's why he, he like grew so tall. Yeah. He was yeah. like, you're not going to mock me. And then just thought really hard about growing. And then yeah, his hands got massive. My name is Seaman. Do you want some? Yeah. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> I know. But so when, when was the first time that you became a diehard football fan? Was it ever since you were a kid? 
Yeah, ever since I was a kid. My dad sort of, well, my dad says he gave me the option whether I was going to be a football fan or not. But every picture of me from the age of like sort of naught to three is just me and Crystal Palace kit. Um, <laughs> so I think it was sort of thrust upon me. But yeah, I, I, I just um, absolutely loved it. I, I couldn't, couldn't blame and stop. Really? Um, yeah. Just, I don't know. There's something about it that just, just clearly it, appeals to me. I innately. think it, it is quite, it's like a handover, isn't it? I, think, I feel like it does come from parents a lot of the time. Because my parents didn't really care about football and then I don't, yeah, nor did I don't I. really care. But a lot of people whose parents are mad about it, generally yeah. the kids. Then but but then sometimes it. you reject it. Do you know what I mean? Like I think it's, there's pro you've probably got a predisposition to just like really getting lost and carried away in like the narrative of it and the emotion of it. Do you know what mm. I mean? Like I think I'm really susceptible to like, you know, like a, like a rags to riches story or like a sob story or something like that. I, Jamie, right. yeah, that's right. me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's totally you me. You should you should sit down and listen to what this guy's been through. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> he had to get the tube once. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh my god, tube, tube all the way to... You do this every time. You're exactly the I same. I got the tube here. Oh mate. my god, you, you play this whole <laughs> like, like card story. didn't work. <laughs> it was really embarrassing. <laughs> it it was like seek assistance. I was like, about what? <laughs> <laughs> Can I pay in diamond? Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but wait, so do you, do you have brothers and sisters then? Got a brother called Peter, Peter Petz. Peter Petz. So, and he's a football fan as well? Well, sort of. Not not as much as me. We all support Crystal Palace in the family, but he's not, he, he won't actively follow it. Really? Yeah. But, but what's interesting is that you then as a young kid, your dad would have taken you to the games and you would have been like properly in there, full on, let's go like that. And I suppose like it, it would have been a bit more, I don't know, unique for it. It's typically what you see. So the natural thing, it's sort of not son and father going to the games, but being a daughter, it, you know, in the, in the games, enjoying it. That must have been unique and kind of an amazing experience to have that with your dad. Yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's really nice, actually. Me and my dad are going to watch um, England women's this evening in Brighton, which is just really it's nice, amazing. isn't it? Mm. And I think, um, I think probably the important thing to remember is even though I am a woman, I ostensibly feel the role of son. So, uh, so I remember when I first came out to my dad, he was like, yeah, it's just a bit for me to get my head around. Like I sort of did imagine having a son-in-law that I'd go and, you know, play golf with, go, go to, mm. to football with and all of this stuff. And I was like, dad, you've just described me. Like I'm the son-in-law you never had. <laughs> I think it's absolutely fine. What, what was that experience like? Because I always, uh, you know, um, you know, growing up and then, you know, using humor and all that different stuff. And your comedy is so interesting, amazing, because you kind of cover a lot of, a lot of personal things that happened to you right throughout yeah. your life and sort of breaking down barriers and all these different things. Um, when you came out, is that quite, you know, it, the typical thing which, you know, I sp speak to some of my gay friends and it's, you know, some people had an easy experience, some people had a hard experience. Mm. For you, was it easy or was it hard? Firstly, very noble that you have gay friends. That is so... <laughs> yeah, thanks yeah. so much. Well we just threw it in there. Don't well worry, done. guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hey, guys. For the yeah. second yeah. time, round uh, of applause. I just want to say it one more time. I have gay friends. Wow. <laughs> yeah. 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 Clip that up and put it on social media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's in your book, isn't <laughs> it? What a guy. <laughs> it's a chapter. <laughs> it's like when, <laughs> when someone's talking about racism. They're like, I've got loads of black mates, honestly. <laughs> like, I just spend so much time with them. It's like, you're now sounding really awkward. <laughs> like, <laughs> just sounding like a racist. So, sort of like the lady doth protest too much. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I have loads of gay friends. <laughs> uh, well, can you submit a list by yeah. the by the end of the yeah, podcast? Yeah, I'll Actually, do it. How gay are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, put, put numbers on it. Sixty four percent. No. Um, what was the question? What is oh, was it hard question coming out? Yeah, was it hard coming out? Yeah. Where uh, did you do it? I would have done it at the game. <laughs> Where did it? <I> <laughs> So he can't hear you. Like, yeah, Dad. He's like, what? Do it. Do a chant. Yeah. I'm fucking gay. He's I'm like, fucking gay. I don't remember that one. <laughs> <laughs> the only way to do it. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I did it. Uh, well, you sort of. There's no one fixed moment where you sort mm. of do a party and get everyone gathered mm. round and like a. Like a gender reveal, but for sexuality. Like, <laughs> well, I don't know what it would be. Like, the balloon pops open and it's all pink, and I'm like, "Yeah, that's that's who I like to shag." <laughs> <laughs> um, but I suppose it's one of the. It's it's just you know I I think that and perhaps it's too a personal uh, conversation we don't have to have. But I just what I what I I enjoy is that you again with your comedy and your stand up you're just very open about your whole existence and things that you've been through and the fact that you know and I read your amazing Guardian article 
Yeah, I mean, it was so good. And, you know, yeah, yeah, and, and, and t- you know, they, they wrote so... And also what they mention is that within the comedy uh, industry, you're just highly respected by your friends and your peers and things like that. That's what it talks about. And for me, I think that being open and having those discussions, but also turning it into sort of a... a um, making light of that sort of conversation is amazing because you've had had experiences where people don't know if you're a girl or a guy, yeah. right? And that must be quite tricky growing up sometimes, right? Yeah. So um, it's that thing where people people get so bogged down in like um, feeling really awful if to, like they get your category, what they perceive to be your category wrong. So if if they call me a man and then realize that they've made a mistake, they get so flustered and so embarrassed. But I'm just like, <laughs> This is so funny. And it's also that thing of like, you know, if you're like a really tall person, people go, you're tall. It's like, yeah, I know. I haven't sort of dressed like this by accident. Like I know that I wear men's clothing. I'm very tall. I wear a binder. So like, I don't, like I have a flat chest. Like I know what you're seeing as well. Like I've looked in a mirror. Mm. Um, so it really doesn't bother me, but I find it really funny when, when people, people get really upset or like flustered. Yeah, but I, I think that I think that's what happens a lot of the time. I remember I, it's like the worst. I remember at school when um, a teacher would come up and it would be a female teacher, and by action you'd call them sir. Yeah, and you would then freak absolutely out, absolutely annihilate. Yeah, 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 yeah that, that was that, that was the worst. The Everyone's worst. absolutely losing their minds. <laughs> You're talking about it for weeks. If you called your, if you called your teacher mum by mistake, <laughs> if you, did you do that? Oh my god, you let your dad, mummy. Yeah, yeah. Oh honestly, my god, that's it, it, it was over. worse. But then, so when did you start? getting interested in comedy because you know you grew up in kent you came you then went to university in london at 18 years old studying english you've done your research oh get out of town well. get out of town what thorough thorough <laughs> journalism <laughs> I know. Mm. really stunning it. that's why i didn't sleep last night it wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't the heat in a wikipedia <laughs> hole about me <laughs> yeah, yeah, i don't yeah. even have a wikipedia jamie was up last he's, night no, writing yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's <laughs> I know, just doing it all for you <laughs> but but when did you start becoming interested in comedy so I, I was interested in comedy sort of, I wasn't a comedy fanatic when I was a teenager, but I liked, I liked it. And I really loved stuff with like a sort of likable central character, like Vicar of Dibley. I used to mm. love Vicar of Dibley. So it was so good. good. So it was, but, good. But, it, but why was it so good just quickly, Tanner? Because it, is it that funny or is it, was it just kind of the only sort of thing like it on television at the time? I think it's, it's a, like if you watch it now, you find it funny because it's like a nostalgia watch. Mm. Like you're remembering how funny you found it when you were a teenager. And I, I, no, I think it's really funny because it's like that fish out of water thing of like this, like highly intelligent, smart woman comes into a- And she's just surrounded by the most like hilarious, like imbeciles. Yeah, 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 it's amazing. And I, I love that. No, 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 Yes. <laughs> oh, it's just so, great. Yeah. It's just great in terms of like- archetypes and just yeah. you you know exactly the perspective of each of those characters i think it's wonderful um so, so you like that you like that as comedy and so that was kind of your way into this world type thing yeah and then so i, th- I remember really clearly when i was like 14 or something because i was in all of the like plays at school and stuff mm. and i was always you know tr- trying to be the center of attention trying to be really funny and um one of my teachers was like, you should do stand-up comedy. And I sort of never, never considered it. I didn't really watch that much stand-up, but then I sort of started watching vague bits on YouTube. And then I got to uni, um, did loads of like plays, realized that I was just like playing a different version of myself and not like I would do, we do like Hamlet and I'd be playing it for laughs. Um, <laughs> so, so then I, uh, yeah, after I left uni, I, when I was 21, I just started doing open mics. See, that, that is, for me is the most insane thing because I, 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 I say this every time, but I've done stand up like a couple of times, yeah. right? And it is the most intimidating, daunting thing in the entire world. And I was lucky because I had, you know, I'd been on TV, right? So people kind of knew. They were on your side. They were on your side straight yeah. away. Doing an open mic night. Walking in and that microphone in front of you and you've never tested any material, you've never done anything and you just do it. And no one's like, it's not like you're going to do a job. You yourself have given you that. You've had a word with yourself and you said, fuck it, I'm going to go and do yeah, this. Yeah, but That is insane to me. It, like when you describe it like that, yeah, it is absolutely insane. Like it's... The- it's Imagine you Mick, going up and just doing this. There's just no <laughs> way. <laughs> I would crumble. I yeah. would crumble. It's a behavior of a psychopath. Like yeah. I've absolutely no... And people like, they're often now, when they find out that your job is stand-up comedian, they'll be like, oh, that's so brave. And I'm like, it's not brave now because I've done it enough times that mm. I don't really get that scared anymore. 
um i mean obviously i get scared for certain stuff but uh, and i also like i know how to do it um it was brave when i first started because i've never known nerves like it and um i don't know what kept me coming back because like like five minutes of payoff for like eight hours of crippling anxiety. Mm. <laughs> yeah. It's, it doesn't seem worth it, but somehow I just kept getting back up on stage, just going, oh, I don't like this. I don't like this at all. And then fortunately, like about a year in, I was like, no, I do really like this. This is good. It's like one of those things again, which always happens is when you ever, you have like something big to do just before you're about to go on, all you want to do is be hit by a car. Yeah. You just want it. You just want to, and not to kill you. You just want it to be clipped. <laughs> You want to be so clipped. You don't, so you don't have to yeah, do it. you just yeah, want to be yeah, yeah. clipped. You want to be clipped by a car. Clip. Just a little clip that you have to go to hospital that you can't do it. And that, sorry, I got hit by a car. Yeah. That's what you want before it. But I like probably when, quite a good business idea that. Actually. Yeah, but where hire yourself out as a sort of well, like just almost say, hitman. Yeah, and like, if you want to just get clipped by a car, give me a call. <laughs> you just do it. Stand like outside way. for road call, and I'll I really <laughs> like that. <laughs> and I'll come and Great run over back. your toe. Third time, we're getting <laughs> yeah. a round of applause. That is wonderful. Thank you. You're a fire day. Really Shit, good. I need it's, to up my it's game. Monday. <laughs> it's Monday. But but where does that inner confidence come from? Because I always, I always find typically with comedians, right? This is, and I spoke to Phil Wang about this. Yeah. Phil Wang says the amazing thing about comedians is that typically comedians are people who kind of reflect. It's a lot of reflecting, and that's why they make things funny because they think, "Oh, that's funny." It, you know, the fact that you sit in a traffic jam, like they reflect on things. So, and when you're reflecting on things, that typically means that you're in scenarios or situations where you're leaving this scenario, and you go, "Ah, it would have been funny if I had said that." And and what I find with most comedians, they're quite introverted. Not saying you're an introvert too, but like a lot of comedians are. So when there, it's a juxtaposition between then going on stage and having the confidence within yourself to do that. So where does that balance go? Why is there so much confidence to going on stage and do it? But then typically with most com comedians, they're a bit introverted. Does that make sense? Yeah, I suppose so. I, I don't know where that, that sort of confidence comes from. I guess it's just, um, yeah, I, I don't know where, because it kind of runs counter to the the values that I have. Like I don't necessarily think that I've got something like, I'm an amazingly important person with something incredible to say. Mm. And you, you'd you think that people that got on stage and was like, please look at me, would think that they are an yeah. amazingly important person. I think it is just like... Um, is it the fact that it's just you, you have the desire to make people laugh? I was going to say, do you That's think it's, that, it it's the pursuit of that laughter and, and maybe also acceptance as well? Because it's like, yeah. oh, this is what I do. I think it's exactly that. It, you're, not, you're not going on there with the express like purpose of changing someone's worldview or doing something quite grandiose it is it, at the base it starts with how do i make this group of people laugh and hopefully like all of the rest of that stuff that you've just described comes with it but yeah first and foremost it's going maybe i just like the feeling of making a bu mm. bunch of people laugh so yeah it's worth putting up with those eight hours of like crushing yeah of, like anxiety. literally being sick. i honestly yeah. man, i think you should try i think we should do this yeah. thing i think a hundred percent we should like get, have an open mic night and you should actually just give it a go and we should film it yeah, you yeah. Doing a private what, what, <laughs> yeah yeah what, yeah I just, what, what to say this and we should definitely <laughs> film it yeah yeah <laughs> we should a hundred percent just make don't let me near any roads because uh, <laughs> I will run myself Don't worry, I'll come round. <laughs> I think you would be freaking genius at it. But then also, Clay, what you've done is you, you've set up something which you call the um, LOL word, the LOL word, right? Mm -hmm. What is that? So basically we started it in 2017. It's a, it's a bunch of like queer comics, queer women, non-binary comics who, um, it's me, Jody Mitchell, and a, a duo called Shelf, Rach and Ruby. And um, we set up also with a girl called Chloe Green. And we basically, Shelf had a room in Edinburgh, but they didn't have like a show to fill it with. What Shelf? is, is, is it's like a Double act, Rachel, Rachel and Ruby. Got it. Okay, cool. And um, so we, they, they were just like to us, do you want to come and do like a mixed bill? So we, we did a show and we were just like, oh, this would be fine. And then it just like sold out because basically the lesbians show up. Like if you ask a lesbian to come to an event, they are there. Um. Anna. Is that what happens? Yeah, you, you just, you do the lesbian, you just go, lesbians assemble! And then they all... It's like a transformer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, and then we create one big giant lesbian that, to take that... Down, what, that just goes around just taking over the world? Taking down the patriarchy, yeah, yeah. one by one. Crushing men in our way. Um, yeah, so that happened. And uh, and then, yeah, we, um, we basically... Uh, it because it went so well we started putting on shows in london 
um, and then various shows around the UK. And now we've got like a monthly show that we do at the Soho Theatre. And it's always raucous. Like it's, it's really funny. There was a bit of a spell a couple of years ago where everyone just got a bit too, like, like everyone took everything a bit too seriously. So it, it would be like, you do a joke about something like, you know, we was talking earlier, I've got a routine about getting pushed over by a bloke. Yeah, in I any, want to hear about this. Like, it, yeah, I'll tell you, <laughs> in any other room, people would be like, that's funny. In that room, they're like, that must have been so traumatic. <laughs> yeah, it just comes like, it comes <laughs> like yeah. serious. Yeah, yeah. The lesbians just want to like all sit there in, in a sort of, like a like a prayer circle almost just like processing trauma together oh, once <laughs> once we've disassembled from being a transformer yeah, we yeah. just sit there and are like <laughs> how long hurt it, you how long does it take you to disassemble how does how long does it take you to come down from being the transformer when all of you guys come together we're um like sort of so many hours because we have to process all of our feelings whilst we're doing it <laughs> <laughs> so wait so what happened so you were in a situation where a bloke pushed you over what? <laughs> what happened i just like i just men okay mm -hmm. most of them are absolutely lovely really nice some of them awful so I, I was literally just walking along the street and have you have you ever had this where <laughs> just walking along yeah. the street? have you ever had that where you've just been walking along the street jamie hasn't yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you just get carried? On a, <laughs> yeah, I just get since carried 2011 on a carpet. <laughs> when he first joined <laughs> Made in Chelsea. Carried on a carpet. That's all the time I carried on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Wait, so what happens? So you're walking down the street. What happened? Walking down the street. Uh, and it was a, it was quite like a busy street. It was near Buckingham Palace. And um, everyone Bought was... that main strip down to... Not the not the, not the big not the big strip. <laughs> what the what, Pall Mall? One <laughs> of the adjacent roads. Okay. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Thank you. But that's great world building. Yeah, Thank yeah. you. Uh so I'm just walking and then there was this little space so I just thought, Do you know what? I'm just going to I'm just going to nip into it. But I'm just going to nip into that space. And then there was this massive guy who looked like um He didn't have a tall long hat on him. <laughs> totally. <laughs> Holding a gun. You buy the palace. Yeah, I was very... Lincoln. <laughs> Abraham Lincoln. I was by the palace. I was trying to break in, and then Abraham Lincoln stopped me. Yeah. Thank God he's around. I Otherwise, thought... what would you have done to the Queen? But wait, why is he haunting this? That's a funny place for, for him to have chosen. Imagine if Lincoln was like uh, a ghost and was like touring all of the places that he didn't get to go when he was alive. Anyway, um, <laughs> this huge guy. He looked like sort of. Um, like a like a stack of packets of processed ham. That's yeah, that's how I would describe what, it. what he was. <laughs> yeah, like yeah just masquerading as an adult human man. <laughs> yeah. And then, so I just like nipped across him, gave him so much room. But he um he like uh nicked my feet because he obviously felt like I was getting in his way. He nicked my feet, so I tripped. And as what? I tripped, he put his hands on my back and pushed You're me kidding. to the floor. The You're fuck? joking. I'm not joking. <laughs> the, the, I'm not joking. The nicking of the feet. The I mean, nicking, like, like he was like I was for on goal and, and he wanted to save it. He wanted to save it. So he just nicked me, pushed me down. And um and I, I stood up and was like, What the fuck? Yeah. What the hell? So I turned around and was like, What the fuck is wrong with you, mate? You've just pushed me over. Why have you done this? Mm. And then he, um, do you want to leave it on a cliffhanger? Yeah, we could we leave it on a cliffhanger. Well, it's up to you. It's your oh, podcast. Oh, yeah, yeah. Do you know what? Let's leave it on a cliffhanger. Yeah, okay. Because we're going to find out what happens next in part two. Yeah. Yeah. Let's end on yeah. that. Let's end on that. <laughs> find out what happens next in part two. Chloe, you're going to tell us, right? <laughs> nah. nah. Yeah, <laughs> that's it. All right, everyone. We'll see you in part two. Bye-bye. Hello everyone, welcome back to part two of Private Parts. Still here with Chloe Pets. Chloe, you left us on a cliffhanger. Yeah. You were outside Buckingham Palace. <laughs> you got tripped and pushed by a guy. What happened next? So I stand up and I, I sort of, I get up and I'm going to this guy, why the hell did you just push me? What the heck? Yeah. Why, why the heck have you just pushed why me? The why, the, yeah. why the heck? You could you... tell he was very intimidated by me. <laughs> why the <laughs> heck? Heck. You ham. Oh, hecking hell. <laughs> Anyone um, who says heck is all heck. Oh, yeah. heck. <laughs> heck. Oh, heck. That's it is really fun to say heck over and over. Heck. Rest, heck. rest of the podcast. Heck. I think you say, if you say under your breath, it's better. Heck. Oh, heck. <laughs> 
you know, I know that sounds one? weird. Like you just had a wank or something. Oh, you did. Heck. Do you know, oh, heck. <laughs> my, my mates um, <laughs> and, being, and being caught. And you didn't mean to And like, being caught. Yeah, said, oh, yeah. heck. Oh, heck. <laughs> Imagine oh. having a wank and then saying, oh, heck. <laughs> <laughs> I think I actually have done that before. <laughs> I think, oh, heck. Oh, heck. <laughs> that, that honestly doesn't surprise me. That feels like anyone that's been on Made in Chelsea, that's the rule. Oh, After you've all you're talking to someone called Heck. Oh, Heck. <laughs> oh, Heck. We've done it again. <laughs> oh, um, uh, yes, my mate Imogen has started saying the word drat again. Drat. Which uh, I think is so which good. Which is, uh, what's his name? Off, my uh, mate. Catch the Pigeon. Didn't he used to say that? Drat. Catch the Pigeon. Gin catch, catch the, the Pigeon. pigeon. <laughs> what was it? Muttley and what was he called? Dick uh, Dastardly. Dick Dastardly. Dastardly. Yeah. God, you just sort of unearthed <laughs> something yeah, yeah, from yeah. me there. Is this, is this trauma? <laughs> no, not at all. It was just, you said what, catch we need the to pigeon and then I just... <laughs> what, what you didn't see is he just like basically regurgitated like our whole childhood. But it, 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 it almost looked like you weren't... Catch in, the Pigeon. <laughs> it looked like you weren't in control of your mouth. Catch the Pigeon. Just like, <laughs> some, like some sleeper cell who's just been awake. It felt like my soul Killing just, everyone. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Catch the pigeon. Catch the pigeon. Yeah. You're basically just going into like a doing weird trance to block everything out, all the thing you all the chaos you're causing. Catch the pigeon. Catch the pigeon. That was crazy. <laughs> Catch the pit Wow. Well I used to fucking love that show. Wait, hang on. So wait, what happened? Right, yeah, sorry, I so, should just finish the story track. and then we'll um so I'm going, what the heck? And then it, and then <laughs> drat. He, he drat. <laughs> and then he goes, uh he, he like genuinely i've never seen someone just like their face just change and reassemble itself in such like a drastic way and he was like i'm so sorry i thought you were a bloke and i went to him like what <laughs> the fuck mate like <laughs> like so what so yeah. what if you thought i was a bloke and then his but, argument was he thought you were a bloke yeah it's okay to push you over because yeah. i thought you were a bloke but now i know that you're a woman right and i would never have pushed you over you know yeah. Women and children on the boat first. That's my moral code of conduct. But he, <laughs> he, um, but then I, it's this thing where, because this happens to me quite a lot, like I can now like read a situation where when someone thinks I'm a man, someone thinks I'm a woman. So on this one, if his moral code of conduct is, I don't push women, I don't lay hands on women, I was like, well, I've got carte blanche here because whatever I say to him, he's no. not going to react back. So I just followed him down the street screaming at him going you're a fucking prick how dare you never do that to anyone again you're an embarrassment to yourself you're an embarrassment to your family and um he just I remember sort of, you went in yeah i went in Sh oh yeah. rat i said yeah. oh hecking heck heck yeah heck heck oh look there's a pigeon yeah yeah it was great and i hope i hope he felt so ashamed but it's also that good thing of like i did come away from that situation feeling like quite angry and upset but then stand up is an amazing thing because it gives you the last word because yeah. you get to you get to write that story package that story go mm. around the country telling that story and have people on your side laughing at that guy and it feels like a very sort of cathartic therapeutic pro uh, process to sort of Just be able to like process ultimate revenge really isn't it? yeah yeah <laughs> i've never thought revenge. of it that way that's exactly what it's like he can't, he can't answer he's got yeah. no response yeah that's Unless he comes and heckles, but I'll sort him right out. <laughs> yeah. that, that, that's why in comedy it's quite good, I suppose, to to make to to make jokes about trauma or whatever things have happened to you, because actually it it, it releases all of that anger or tension. Exactly that. You... that. Yeah, because they always say, you know, they always say in, inverted anger can lead to depression, right? So when people are so angry about stuff and they yeah. don't actually release yeah. it, then it can really hurt you. So actually going on stage and releasing all of that things that have happened to you in the past is actually a really great way to get over stuff. You know, when you like something happens you have an argument or something and then you don't say the thing that you wanted to say and then the next morning you're in the shower and you're going oh god oh, i should have said that i should have said that stand up gives you a release for that because you get to relive that that situation every day and say the thing that you should have said it's great also the great thing you say about uh comedy is the fact that you basically wanted a life of retirement and that's, <laughs> and that's what got, comedy is basically where you just get to watch movies in the day and then just go and do yeah. a little thing at night that's why i'm annoyed that you've got me in here at 9 30 in the morning <laughs> I, I was never meant to be made for this i should still be in bed come on guys hey listen edinburgh's coming up yeah. um august whole month Anybody find what I've done it? I did a, a few days once at the uh, Udderbelly, but it's amazing that I find that every single night for a month, comedians all around the world go there and they put on a show every single night. Yeah. And you're going up there. I want to hear about your show. I heard a rumor <laughs> that um, 
you uh, could be a winner this year. It's ba- we'll talk about it really quickly because I don't no, want to no, tell get us. bogged down in like the awards thing of it. But basically, like the way that the Edinburgh Fringe works is there's like a main comedy award mm. where you essentially like the best shows of the Fringe get nominated and then one wins at the end. And then there's sort of like a subsidiary sort of um, like newcomer award where again, people doing their first hour can get nominated for that award and then they'll pick a winner. Um, it's one of those things where you you just can't, you can't go focused on that because you, if you're trying to, if you're trying to win an award that is decided on by a bunch of other people, then like, again, that's anxiety, isn't it? Because you're mm. fo- fixating on something outside of yeah. your control. And I think the best way to do it is just focus on the quality of your work, making a show that you enjoy performing and that you are excited to do. And then the rest of that stuff is just- And what of, will be, what will be. Yeah, it's, it's, it's noise that you don't need. And like, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna sit here and lie to you. Like the day that the newcomer award gets announced, if I'm not on it, I will be a bit disappointed, but it will last for one day. And then I'll, I'll think about all of the amazing things that I have like been privileged enough to have in my career and just sort of get on with it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, how, that's it. So, what is the show called? Transience. Transience. Yeah. Okay, and uh, you're going up there. What days it start? What? What? Th- where is it? All that kind of stuff. So, I, th- I think it starts on the second or third of August, <laughs> somewhere <laughs> around there. Um, and I'm, at, I'm, at, you know, Pleasant's Courtyard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm at Pleasant's upstairs at six p.m. and uh, I'm well excited for it because uh, I've been sort of like doing like a a small tour of the show already. Mm. So usually like around this phase, you'd be like absolutely shitting yourself going, oh God, I've got to have a show ready in a month. Whereas I did all of that in May when I had to have it ready for the Soho Theatre. So I'm just buzzing because I'm like, yeah, I know my show inside out. I'm ready to do it. I'm excited to perform it every day. That must be the greatest feeling when you have a show so under your belt. Like, like, so you, it's like when you do a play when I was at school and you just go, fuck, I know my lines. I I know what I'm saying in this. Like like that's, so when you have it, that means also, I suppose you can kind of play with it a bit more because you, you know, which bits the audience are going to really like, and then you can almost like draw it out of them so much because you're so comfortable with the whole thing. And when you know it inside out, you can sort of start self editing on stage. So I did, I did it last night and in my head, I was like, Oh, I get to this bit and the show always dips Mm. and I don't really enjoy doing it. So I was just like, hang on a minute. You don't have to do it. Just cut it out. Mm. And then I found another segue to the next bit and it's made the show so much better because Look, if you're if you're bored of the things that you're saying on stage, mm. and how can you expect the audience to be? Yeah, interested? yeah, yeah, complete. Is, do you, with your comedy, do you like telling a story? Is that is that how it works with transience? Is it like a story going through? It's not a story per se. I'd say there's like refrains. So it's like it's stand up routines all on a similar theme, building mm. to sort of a crescendo, and then between the routines, I'd say there's like explanations, call callbacks, and stuff. So it does hang together as a neat thing, but it's not like a story about a man pushing me over. Do you know what I mean? It's that's in there, but that's just, yeah, it's not one big story. God, it must be, it just, it, cause it's the, it's the pinnacle, right? Like not the pinnacle, but it's Edinburgh is where so many legends have been made. Yeah. And you know, I, I remember I was up there with Rose Matafeo when she won best newcomer. She's amazing. It, she's now killing it. Yeah. And, and what's so great. I just, I, I feel like loads of female talent has come out of Edinburgh recently who are just smashing it. Yeah. Which seems like a really kind of cool place. Because typically, you know, it was always men. It was always men, the Coogans and whoever, always these people doing it. It was never women doing it. But now I feel like women have taken that sort of leap and are now, uh, you know, they're, they're sort of more popular in lots of ways. Because, because like, society is allowing them to be. Like, there's still, there's still so much of that culture of, like, I don't usually find women funny, but you're great. And people still say that. Does that happen? Oh, yeah. But Shut it, up. No way. So, seriously. Seriously. I've been supporting. I supported Ed Gamble on tour earlier this year. So, you know, getting introduced to lots of new audiences that hadn't seen me before. What I'd do is it, uh, if my tour show was coming back to that city, I'd go around at the interval flyering people in a quite sort of capitalist soul destroying, like <laughs> selling my wares kind of way. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> men and women will come up to me and say, I don't usually find women funny, but you were great. And I'm like, that is. Does that annoy you? Yeah, of course it does. Yeah. Of course it annoys me. I'm like, I am like, well. But how do you counter that? So how, how like that's a, that's a really, it, it's a kind of really, um, like that's a hurtful thing, right? Because it's your craft and someone is saying, oh, you're, you're, it's like when someone said, you know, you are, oh, you're actually quite funny. 
It's like the expectance is you're you're not going mm. to be. So it's it doesn't bother me. I just feel sorry for like their their like wives, girlfriends, sisters, like children that like oh you don't find any of them funny, do you? The way I respond is that they're like uh I don't usually find women funny. I'm like, yeah, that's true. None of them are like Catherine Ryan. She's absolutely dog shit. You know? <laughs> I'm the only funny one. Do you know what I mean? Has that always happened though? Like, do, do you, for you, have that, has that always been a challenge throughout your career? It's like you, have you thought you walk on the stage because I'm female, people are going to think I'm not funny. So I have to prove to them that I am funny. It's not, it's not as much anymore. I can't, I'm not going to sit here and say like, it's uh it's like a, a massive issue but there will be rooms again it's that thing of because i've done it so much now i understand when i understand when it's happening like you mm. can you can there are like micro things that you'd be able to notice from experience and um yeah sometimes you you can tell it's like a bunch of meathead men they'll like they'll sit there with their arms folded like come on and make me laugh and some mm. of them you'll never crack some of them you do but but you think there's more of a challenge sometimes because you're female. Yeah, definitely. I, but again, I don't want to overstate it. I don't want to be like, um, yeah, it happens all the time. And also it is like a hard thing to say because sometimes when you argue that, like it is harder for women, people will be like, well, maybe you're just not funny. And it's like, mm. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that I am okay at this. Yeah. <laughs> and um, uh, yeah. And, but genuinely, most audiences are lovely and, and want the best for you and, and completely wish you well. But it can be that that one guy, if it's like a, if it's like a small club, that one guy that's sat there, maybe he'll heckle you or something, and he he's feeling intimidated that he's not the funniest guy in the room. Yeah, that can stink up the whole room because he's trying to undermine your authority. Um, how, how does it work? It's you, quite it's quite interesting, just like from like a historical perspective, like where that's come from, because it's obviously been what's been allowed to be funny, and obviously men kind of you know they had the control, and so it was like they weren't allowed, women weren't allowed to be yeah. funny. They weren't allowed to fucking do anything at one point. Yeah. So now it's like, I guess it's just taking time to slowly get rid of that and deconstruct all of these like yeah, definitely. bonkers old ways of thinking. I think. Yeah. Where where has that come from? The fact that people there's this sort of stereotypical well, thing women, that women, women aren't funny. Work at one point. Do you know what I mean? Like so. <laughs> no, but no, but as in, no, not saying that's true, right? But that's what it is. And people, like you said, people come up to you and say, "Oh, you, oh, you, I, I don't find women funny, but you actually are." Well, why why is that a thing? Like, where does that even come from? I feel like um. I think historically it's partially that of like women have always been like, you have to be quiet. You have to be seen, not heard. You mm. have to sort of, it's embarrassing if you were to like, uh, you know, outshine your husband or something. I guess fundamentally it's a control thing, isn't it? Control. It's That's what it exactly is. Because if they're start, if they're outshining, you're, the man's losing control and yeah. they're not. Every now and again, they might be like, oh, she's she's quite funny sometimes, but she has to stay. Yeah, within. stay in your lane. Yeah. yeah. But then in the seventies, like, and 80s and that, like, women were, were, like, considered so mainstream funny. Victoria Wood, Joe Brand, French and Saunders, all of this. Yeah. It, it feels like, it almost feels like when progress happens it, and men feel like they're losing they control, then pull it back. they then pull it back. So it's then that, oh, let's reinforce the narrative of I don't find what women stuff funny. I don't find periods that, funny. That I don't seems find to happen in yeah, quite a broad spectrum of of. of parts of society when things get a bit too loose and it goes outside of the control then they fucking stamp on it and they're like right let's pull it back in again not to get too serious but that's why Roe versus Wade has happened is mm. when right wingers think that they're losing control they really clamp down and and often the recipient of the clamping down is women and they police their bodies as a as a means of like wider societal control mm. so I suppose then when when you do have the success that you have, Chloe, and you, the fact that you, you're doing these tours and things like that, and you're going to stage and people are loving your shows, that must be like, you know, fucking come on. It just must be a real kind of, um, I just think, you know, especially going to Edinburgh and doing this and hopefully being nominated and stuff like that. <laughs> it, you know, I, and I truly believe, and it, it must be just a real, when your show's doing well, it must be such a great feeling aside that the work, the hard work that everyone's put in, male or female, whoever it is, but being congratulated for your work must be awesome. It's great. It's really nice. It's really nice to hear nice things. Um, and uh, yeah, I think what's really cool is being a person who's masculine presenting, uh, being able to like go and talk about all of that stuff in an accessible way to a room of people that might not necessarily have heard about those experiences. And we can all laugh together and hopefully like I'm teaching them something in 
a non-patronizing, non-didactic kind of way, just in a funny way of just like, oh, look at my life. Oh, it's the nicest feeling in the world because you hope that those people that haven't seen that might go away and just, yeah, understand someone in their life a bit better mm. or someone walking down the street a bit better. They might just, yeah, not judge as much as quickly. And that's a really nice feeling. Do, do you find, how, what is your writing process like? Because I always find, you know, I remember when I, I've said this before, but when I did Made in Chelsea for so long, you know, every single time you, if you're walking into a scene and you have to make it funny, entertaining, all these different things. So a lot of the time you're thinking about content. Yeah. As a comedian, everything's content. Yeah. The fact that you walked in this room today, something funny, that's content. How do you, you know, how do you go into working hours and non-working hours? Because you're presumably writing all the time. Yeah, definitely. And, um, I think that what the, the cool thing is, is that I in initially used to think that you have to like sit down at a desk for four hours and that's what writing is. But mm. that's not what writing is. Yeah. Writing <laughs> is like you're on the tube, you have an idea, you get your notebook out, you jot it down. You've just written. Mm. Um, I think I try not to like be looking at, uh, I, I try not to be like coming into a situation looking for the funny. I just like go in, exist in a situation and then it will be later where you're like reflecting, processing, yeah, as you said earlier, yeah. that your brain goes, oh, hang on a minute, that was a bit funny. There's something in that. Mm. And um, and then, yeah, so what I'll do then is I'll jot down a few ideas, like probably in quite long form, like write it out fully. Then I'll read back those ideas, bullet point that, and then take it to an open, uh, like a new material night and practice it and then record it, listen back, Funny bits keep. Fuck, that's right so intense. Yeah. You're, you're, you're constantly like like judging yourself. Or like I, I, I sometimes can't listen to podcasts back because I'm like, <laughs> oh, fuck, this and that. But you're constantly listening to your material back and going, oh. And, and I suppose even the way like a sentence is formed, by changing the words around, it can make it funnier. That's exactly it. You put the funniest bit to the end of the sentence. Yeah. Isn't that not, is that not like a, a mind fuck sometimes? And, and also when you have off days and you're not being funny, you must be so hard on yourself. You'd be like, shit, I just don't feel funny at the moment. Yeah, but to, on stage, like you just, you do it enough that you slip into that muscle memory where yeah, if you're not feeling it. funny, then you just like act the way that you did three days ago when you were feeling funny. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, totally. It's, it's just a show you're putting on a performance and it's good now that, you know, when I'm, when I'm about to walk out, you just, that switch flicks and you're like, right, Cool. Come on. I got, I got this now. Hey, we had uh, your friend Olga Koch on the podcast. Yeah. She's, by the way, she's a legend. Oh, she's amazing. She is so funny. Yeah. Like, honestly, she's the genius. You guys had pointless together. We had on the podcast. Yeah. You guys won pointless. Yeah. Is that a big moment for you? What do you think? It's the biggest <laughs> moment of my whole career. I'm never, I've peaked so early. I'm never going to do anything better than that, am I? Three pointless answers in the final. Come on. Three? Yeah. Wow. Was it unreal? It was uh like <laughs> I, we were i was absolutely shitting it because pointless is like my parents favorite program so i text my mom like oh, i'm really worried it's, it's not gonna go well like you'll be ashamed of me and she was like yeah i absolutely will be and i was like oh thanks mom like, <laughs> thanks for relieving that pressure <laughs> and then so i was the most nervous i've ever been in my career really? shut up you're lying no i'm not i'm not <laughs> It's the most nervous I've ever been in my career. To go on pointless. A, to go on pointless, yeah. Because A, I want to do well for like, and I haven't done loads of TV, so it's a massive deal for me in that regard. Mm. And the other thing is, I'm so competitive that if I didn't win it, then I'd be sad for weeks. Like, you know, mm. it'd be like England losing to Germany again. Like mum telling me to go, you know, have a shower because I'm crying too much. But, and then we got to the, we got to the like head to head at the end yeah. and I got a really simple question wrong. And I was like, that's it. I fucked it. I fucked it. I'm going to be- That's what he did. Oh, did what you? What did I get wrong? I can't remember, but you fucked it at the end. Are you joking? We got to the final. Yeah, then... I know. We got to the- we got, we got to we, the very, we got got to to the very end. end. Yeah. Yeah. We very oh, end. Well, you didn't fuck it then. You're fine. No, I didn't fuck it at all. But we didn't win. But you got your trophy. We got our trophy. We got, yeah, but, but we didn't get a point. But we got to answer. we got to uh, uh, we got to one on twi on two of them. Yeah. And and we should have had a pointless answer because you said Switzerland. I didn't pick Switzerland. Uh, but anyway, so you thought you'd fucked it. What happened? Because uh, when you got the question wrong. Well, what had happened is, fortunately, we were the were the like lowest scorers the whole way through. So we got to go first on the head to head because mm. both couples knew the two lowest answers on both occasions. So basically, whoever got to go first would go through to the final. So we got the next one right, got through. And then, uh, yeah, Olga and I were there. Premier League questions, a uh, question about the Premier League came up and I was like, do I choose this? Do we choose this? Mm. 
because I'm the only one that can do it and it's all on me or do we choose something that we know a bit less about between us but at least we could both have a go mm. and then Olga just turned to me and was like you've been waiting this for this moment your whole entire life you have to do it so we picked it was there a pause it's like was there a pause like, when you went yeah it's like it's a mad cinematic moment I went, she like kneels lesbians down. unite <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. and we all formed into a transformer and answered the question did together. you did you say when it came out did you go heck <laughs> Oh, drat. <laughs> no, but, but honestly, so I would say now, because the job of stand-up co comedian is like, you, you learn how to manage pressure and you learn how to like keep your body calm mm. in big high pressure situations. Well, with Pointless- <laughs> I didn't, I had to wear tampons. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Arm tampons. It, actually was. it was actually double. They looked so stupid. There were sanitary like... towels underneath his armpits because yeah. he was sweating so much. That's going to help. That made me look even fucking weirder. <laughs> and, and all he kept saying to me was, oh God, oh God, oh, oh God. God. Oh, God. Yeah, I was panicking. Were you, oh God. Were oh you yeah. wearing like a tam tank top and you just had your <laughs> No, I had, I had a, like a long sleeve grey shirt and obviously was sweating profusely. Is that a, a TV trick then? But tamps yeah, up yeah, your arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is now. Yeah, yeah, put tampons <laughs> underneath. Not like not the, the long thin things. Tampons are quite absorbent. They, I reckon they could probably like kill you. Suck all the hydration out of you. <laughs> <laughs> Just quickly tangent. I had, a, fr I had a friend at school. I had a friend at school. This is, I had a friend at school. And I, I think he watched the movie Kids or whatever it was. He used to go and get, he used to go and get um, tampons <laughs> and put it in Ribena and suck it. No. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. You see people, people are doing that <laughs> Yeah, now. that's what you used to do. Uh, at, at raves and stuff, going out to people and be like, do you, want, do you want a vape? And it's just a tampon and they're sucking on the tampon. <laughs> I don't know if they're used or anything, but still, I thought it was quite funny. <laughs> Oh I've never seen that in my life. I've never yeah. seen that in I my life. Made it, up. It's not, <laughs> it is a thing. Is Wait, thing. hang on. So, so it comes to the it comes to the question. Yeah. It's the big question. You've been waiting this your entire life. What and happens? It comes up, and it's literally a question that I could answer in my sleep, mm. right? But, but because of the pressure, because I was so nervous, my body just. I went red, I started getting hot, I started shaking, oh, no. all of this, and I was like, it's not going to come. It's not going to come. And then, fortunately. I thought of three answers and I was like, I don't know if any of these are going to be pointless, but they all were. What? Yeah. What were the, what, what were the answers? The, what, what, were the, the what, was the, what was the question? What were the answers? So it was Premier League champions and then they gave three different teams. So it was like mm. Man U 2012, 2013, uh, Man City 2019, 2020, Liverpool 21, 2022. And you had to name a player, uh, tw 2021, sorry, a player who had like played one or more times for each of those title winning teams right so i said do you want to have a go no do you want to have a go Absolutely. wait so, so, i'd be so, terrible at that one more time man U, yeah. 2012 2013 yeah man city 2019 2020 yeah liverpool 2020 2021 okay and and they and the question was players that have played one or more in those title winning seasons once or more in those title winning seasons oh my god uh pause the podcast and play along at oh home. no here we go um I, 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 uh, Milner Milner w would have played I don't know if he was pointless yeah, was in, but okay, that's a pretty good answer let me yeah. go again let me go again um, well he might have been he might have been oh my god Who? okay um, okay so what was your oh, point well. what did you say I think it, it was a good shout though um, I said Origi oh, uh, god. Lalana and yeah. Tom Cleverly oh my god Cleverly is a good one. It's good, isn't it? That is, yeah. when that popped into your head, you're like, I've got it. Cleverly done. <laughs> wish. But no, because what I did is, um, during like all of the lockdowns, I'd sit on that quiz website called Sporkle. Do you know it? Mm -hmm. And yeah. I just, uh, I just try and write out all of the, um, all of the teams. Um, I know we've got to wrap up soon, but can I tell you a story about Edinburgh? One please, time? please. So you was there with um, Francis. Yeah. What's for Fra Francis? Francis Bull. Francis Bull. <laughs> I thought um, when Francis Bourgeois started coming out, I was like, what's up, made in Chelsea fella talking about trains for? Oh, you thought he was. <laughs> it's actually so true. I got so confused. Because <laughs> like, he is very bourgeois. <laughs> yeah, so I was yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're similar in what's, so many ways. What's yeah. that? Made in Chelsea like talking about trains. <laughs> what's he, what's he talking about trains all of a sudden. Um, right, so you was in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. I was in Edinburgh that year. Did you ever go to the flick? Diane Chorley's The Flick. It was like this little um, like karaoke bar that would be like a club night as well. I don't think I went to it. I was there every night. Okay, I was, <laughs> I was all about the place. And I went, it, I went in one time. And I hope this story doesn't reflect badly on me. I tried to act well at all times. But your mate Francis was in there. And obviously yeah. like he's sort of a celebrity. So it caused a bit <laughs> of a scene. 
And I'm just sort of standing there having a dance. Um, and I see this lime fly across the air <laughs> and your mate Francis is walking out the door yes. and the lime hits him directly yes. on the back of the head. <laughs> and I start, what I should have done is gone, oh, that's absolutely awful. But I think that's really funny. It is funny. So I start absolutely cracking up. He turns around, looks at me, walks, storms over to me and goes, why did you just throw that lime at me? <laughs> That's such a Francis thing to do. And I, well. go, I didn't, I didn't throw that lime at you. And he goes, well, why are you laughing? Then I was like, well, I just thought it's quite funny that of all of the people, the lime could have hit in this room is hit you. Francis of made in Chelsea. And he just went, oh, and stormed out. I love it when people can't take a joke. I know, I know. He's the type of person that would hate And that. then I, I, I turn around and I'm like, I wonder who did throw the lime. And then I turn around and I see this girl that I knew um, who... I know she used to play cricket for England schoolgirls. <laughs> so I was like, she bowled oh, it. She, she <laughs> bowled a lime and she's actually meant to hit Francis on the back of the head. And now I look like the absolute prick oh. that's taking him out. As, so as she hit him, honestly, in the head, there must have been so much excitement that she, it had actually done it. Yeah. She, she was. She couldn't believe it. She was oh, absolutely it. cracking up. And I went, I went over and went, you can't be throwing limes at minor celebrities. It's not. <laughs> It's not on. It's not on. You can't be doing that. And then we did think it was quite funny in the end. I had a, I had a friend, just quickly before we go, I had a friend, um, well, a guy that I know who was in a bar and uh, he was standing at the bar and Hugh Grant walks in, stands next to him. Anyway, he's standing at the bar and there were three people. This person didn't know him and Hugh Grant. Anyway, the person next to him obviously farted <gasps> and he walked off and Hugh Grant turned to this guy and went, have you just farted? <laughs> <laughs> Because that stinks. And he went, No, I haven't. No, I haven't. <laughs> and he Being went, asked uh, by Hugh Grant if you farted is fucking at funny. The bar. It was so good. Uh, Chloe, listen, I, I wish you all the luck um, in the world in Edinburgh. We Transients, it, it's uh, at what theatre can we go and see it? Pleasance upstairs mm -hmm. um, at 6 pm. On and then. Either the second or the third. Which one was it? I can't remember. Well, no, it starts on the second uh. or the third. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it runs the whole month, right? And it runs a whole month, okay. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, I'll do like a spring tour of it sort of around and about. But come see it in Edinburgh. I think it's going to be really fun. Are you going to come? Let's go. I'm, I'm hoping I, that we're going to go out. We really want to go. on tour? Well, no, we're just going to go out for a few days just to like see it and experience yeah. it and see it. So if we come up 100%, we'll come see Let me know and I'll sort you out. Yeah. Oh my come God, on. 100%. And where can we get tickets? Uh, you can get tickets at Ed, the Ed Fringe uh, website. Or on my website. I'm just imagining us turning up. There's fucking loads of limes. <laughs> just, like, <laughs> just, just absolutely lime in there. Or just shouting, make us laugh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, make yeah, us oh, laugh. Oh, make us <laughs> laugh. <laughs> um, and I'll try my best to. Uh, or my website, chloepets.org. Ooh, very org. efficient. Ooh, yeah. uh, lovely. And you can follow Chloe on Instagram, social media, and all that kind of I stuff. I got, this is small fry for you, but yesterday I got up to 10,000 followers. I saw. That's mad, isn't it? You're at 10.7, I think it was. I saw. Stop. No, I can't have leaped that high. <laughs> I don't know. I think it could be. Not overnight. <laughs> I don't know. I don't think. <laughs> People have heard I'm coming on this. They're yeah. so like, oh, give that a follow. <laughs> hey, Chloe, uh, thank you so much for coming on. We really appreciate it. Uh, what we like to do at the end of the podcast is leave our listeners with something inspirational um always wear Birkenstocks with socks because I think it looks cooler <laughs> there we go yeah. everybody have a good week see you yeah. later goodbye